Faith for Today with Colin Urquhart and Julia Fisher. This week we started a new series about the Kingdom of God. And you said yesterday, Colin, that as Christians we are part of God's purpose of seeing his kingdom grow until Jesus returns a second time. So in what way is the kingdom already established here on earth? Well, Jesus came with the gift of the kingdom. Now, that's the first thing that we have got to understand. Nobody can deserve to be part of the kingdom. Nobody can earn his way into the kingdom. No one could ever say that he deserved to be part of the kingdom because of what he or she has done. The kingdom is a gift. Jesus said to his disciples, Fear not, little flock, your father has chosen to give you the kingdom. And so when a person is born again, when he has turned to the Lord Jesus Christ with repentance and faith, then he becomes part of the kingdom. God actually puts the kingdom of God within that person. Because Jesus also said to the disciples, the kingdom of God is not a place. It's not over here or over there. You can't say, you know, here is the kingdom, there is the kingdom. He said, because the kingdom of God is within you. Uh, so when you become a believer, the kingdom of God is actually placed within you. Now, many of the parables that Jesus used that we will be looking at in the coming days and weeks in much more detail, but many of these uh, are parables of growth about how the kingdom begins as a seed, like a mustard seed, smallest of all seeds, yet it grows to be a tree. But contained in the seed is the full life of the tree. So when a person becomes uh, a believer, when they're born again, God puts the seed of the kingdom into that person's life. And contained within that seed is all the life, the power, the authority of God's sovereign rule and reign. But of course, that seed needs to grow and develop and become like a tree that bears fruit so that uh, our lives are fruitful for the purposes of God. By this my Father is glorified, Jesus said, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. That's the fruit that is produced by the Holy Spirit because this kingdom is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's how one of the ways in which Paul describes this kingdom. So this seed that God puts within us um, contains the righteousness of God, the peace of God, the joy of God. Um, Paul also says the kingdom is not a matter of talk but of power. So that kingdom uh, contains the power of God. Uh, and because the kingdom um, can only be manifested in and through the life of the Holy Spirit working within us, Jesus promised the disciples before they were baptized in the Spirit that they would receive power when the Holy Spirit came upon them. So you see, contained in that seed that God puts within the believer is the righteousness of God, the peace of God, the joy of God, the power of God, the full life of God's heavenly kingdom. Um, because Jesus said, I have come that men may have life and have it in all its fullness. That's God's life. It's eternal life. It's the life of God's heavenly kingdom that he puts within us. And we have that fullness of life. Paul says, you have come to the fullness of life. Not you will come at some time in the future when you go to heaven. But if you're a believer and you have received the Lord Jesus Christ into your life, then you have received that life. You have received the fullness of life. You have received the gift of the kingdom. And it is there within you waiting to be manifested through you. Many people ask Jesus, what is the kingdom of God like? It, it, was a, it was a mystery to them, wasn't it? He had to explain it very simply. Well, there's always a fascination, isn't there? You see, what is heaven like? I mean, people ask the same question in a different way, even today. Um, and we wonder, well, what's it going to be like in heaven? 
And uh, although Jesus gives a certain amount of indication, um, there's no real clear uh, concept of what it's going to be like to be in heaven. Um, I think Jesus did that very deliberately. Of course, John received this great revelation of heaven that we read about in the last book in the New Testament. Uh, but even then, uh, John is lost for words he, because he can't really describe what he sees. He says, well, it's like this and it's like that. And Jesus does the same thing. The kingdom of God is like. But when you say uh, something is like uh, it means that you you just cannot possibly describe the reality of it, and you're just looking for analogies to give some idea, some concept of, of what it is like. And so heaven itself is going to be so much greater and more wonderful than anything that even Jesus could describe. Uh, it, it will be indescribable in the glory and the wonder of seeing God as he is, of, of knowing him in his fullness and, and of being there in his presence for all eternity. But what we need to focus on now is not what will heaven or our experience of heaven be like in the future, but in what way has the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven come already? In what way is that kingdom already established here on earth? What does it mean for us to be part of the kingdom? What does it mean to say that I have the kingdom of God within me? How can I live the life of the kingdom here on earth? These are the really pertinent questions. And as you mentioned in yesterday's program, it's all part of what God is doing in the world today. It's the big picture, isn't it? It's the big picture, and yet the big picture is made up of multitudes of small parts. And each one who is a born-again believer is one of those small parts. So the call of God upon every Christian, regardless of denomination or doctrine or anything, but God's call upon every believer is to live the life of the kingdom here on earth. And so we can begin to focus on what this really means by picking up those words that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Where is the kingdom of God present on the earth now? Or where is it visibly present? Wherever the will of God is being fulfilled and accomplished. Your kingdom come, your will be done. You see, Christ reigns and rules where his will is being outworked. He can't reign through sin. He can't reign through fear. He can't reign through sickness and affliction and other things that oppose the life of the kingdom. He can reign in people that are afflicted. But his sovereign rule and reign is expressed in overcoming these things. So when Jesus preached, he preached what we call the gospel, the good news. But what is that? It is the good news about the kingdom of God. You could say that every sermon Jesus preached was about the kingdom of God in some way or another. Every time he preached. Uh, the Sermon on the Mount, for example, the kingdom of God is mentioned um, very rarely in the Beatitudes uh, uh, in chapter 5, and then in chapter 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be added to you. But in reality, the whole of the sermon, all three chapters, 5, 6, 7 of Matthew's gospel are about the kingdom of God, what it means to live the life of the kingdom here on earth. And we see that to live that life is far more wonderful and actually far more demanding than it was to live under the law, which is why Jesus contrasted what was said under the law. You know, you have said, you have heard that it has been said, you shall not commit adultery, for example. Uh, but I say to, uh, to you, whoever looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. In other words, uh, the sovereign rule and reign of God is not just expressed in what we do, but is expressed in what we think, in the attitudes we have, in the way we feel and the way we relate. Uh, it encompasses the whole of life and every aspect of our being. Clearly, some people flourish 
more than others. I'm reminded of the parable of the sower, where some of the seed fell on good ground and some on poor ground. Is there that sense, Colin, that it's up to us as individuals to seek to live the kingdom life as best we can, but there are those who do struggle on the way? Uh, Yes, and Jesus was well aware of this. I mean, you see the struggle uh, in his own ministry because he suffered continual opposition and persecution. And the interesting thing was that the persecution came not really from the world, but from the religious leaders of the time. Uh, And that was because they had no concept, no understanding uh, of the way in which Jesus was establishing the kingdom uh, through what he was doing. They, 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 would, they were clueless, to be honest. And of course, the, the same thing can be true today, that there are many religious leaders who have no real understanding and concept of the kingdom of God. They never preach about the kingdom, never teach about the kingdom. They don't show people how to live the life of the kingdom. They don't know how to exercise the authority and the power of the kingdom. So they have a form of godliness, but without the power. That's what the scripture says. But you see, wherever the kingdom of God is present in reality, then the power of God is present in reality. Because the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. So religious people can actually um, engage in a lot of talk, but you will see very little power in religious sort of churches if I can put it that way, you don't see the power of God, you don't see people being healed, you don't see miracles, you don't see evidence of the presence of the kingdom. All you get is talk. You've been listening to Faith for Today, presented by Julia Fisher. This program is sponsored by Kingdom Faith. For further information, visit our website, kingdomfaith.com. 